much, ma'am. Uh, I think I've been praised too much and the expectations might have been raised. So, I mean, uh, I have done some work on health and uh, my uh, primary realization has been that um, the confusion about responsibility for health is, you know, one of the key challenges that India faces. I mean, uh, I have worked on, uh, you know, drug regulatory reforms on chronic diseases and on, you know, health systems. But I think this is one of the key uh, things that I think uh, we need to sort out before we can really make progress in the health sector in India, uh, because uh, constitutionally, states are responsible for health. So whenever something happens, uh, the central government says that state health is a state subject. You must have often heard that. Uh, but the center does a lot in terms of health sector, you know, in terms of national health mission or, you know, Ayushman Bharat and many other things. Uh, so the center has played a very critical role. And the center, right since independence, has also been responsible for uh, bridging the inequities between the states. So if health is a state subject and every state does its own thing, some states will do it better, some will do it you know, worse. So there will be a disparity between the states. So the center is supposed to play a role in terms of bridging those uh, inequities in the health sector, because as you know, as the federal government, uh, they have this uh, capacity to actually address uh, inequalities between the states. Uh, but I think as far as health is concerned, so there has been, you know, a huge amount of confusion in terms of responsibility. So which is why uh, today I have decided to speak on COVID-19 and the responsibility for health. And especially during the second wave, we saw that, uh, I don't know what happened in Rajasthan, but uh, I was in Delhi NCR. And we saw people running everywhere for oxygen, for medicines, you know, and for arranging a hospital bed. And, you know, so there was a huge amount of crisis. And the impression that people got was that people have been left to their own wits uh, to deal with the problem, to save themselves, to save their loved ones. So, I mean, COVID-19 brought out the issue of the responsibility for health very drastically. And the challenge, you know, came out to the forefront that people, it is people who are supposed to take care of their health, spent on their health care, uh, whether they have to take loans or get indebted. So, you know, uh, that I think the second wave in particular was very uh, significant, that it was very illustrative of this challenge of uh, the responsibility for health uh, in the Indian context. I have also recently worked on uh, the issue of social justice and health. And I have also referred to the debates in political philosophy on in terms of social justice. Uh, so there also you see that in the, in the modern debates on social justice, responsibility, the, 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 the concept of responsibility is the key notion. For example, the German uh, philosopher uh, Friedrich Hayek argues that you cannot uh, designate something unjust unless you can hold somebody responsible for that. So if let's say we can, we see there is a display here. And if we say that this is unjust, so we need to hold somebody responsible. Somebody has to be responsible for this uh, display before we can call it unjust or just. If we cannot hold anybody responsible, then it's just a uh, accident. It just happened. Nobody could have done anything about it. I think about COVID-19 also uh, different, I mean, uh, so uh, let me uh, start with a disclaimer that when I talk about the state or the government, I don't refer to any particular political uh, you know, party or a specific government. I'm talking in a very generic sense, you know, government as such, state as such. So I please don't take my comments uh, as referring to any political party or any specific government. It's a very generic sort of argument that I'm going to make today. Uh, so, you know, uh, in the second wave also we saw this very clearly so which is why i thought uh, this is something that we really i mean this is the elephant in the room that we need to tackle and so i am going to actually first of all talk about uh, the context of health in india and you know how things are in terms of financing and the responsibility and governance and then i am going to make two sets of arguments uh, the epidemiological argument and the ethical argument of why governments or the state should take care of most of the structural challenges about health. And I'm going to make a distinction between preventive responsibility and curative responsibility as far as epidemiology is concerned. And then what are governments supposed to do? What is the expectation from governments 
as far as the ethical argument is concerned. So, uh, can I have a slide? So the first part is, you know, very descriptive. Let me start reading it out. So my first slide is about, uh, it's a quotation from W.B. Yeats' uh, poem, The Second Coming. Uh, turning and turning in the widening gyre, the falcon cannot hear the falconer. Things fall apart, the center cannot hold. Mere anarchy is loosed upon the world. So W.B. Yeats wrote this poem in 1919 in the aftermath of the First World War and the 1918-1999 flu pandemic. His uh, wife was pregnant and she had caught the virus and was very close to death. So there is a resemblance between what happened in the flu pandemic of 1919 and what happened during the second COVID wave in India. But it almost seems that Yeats was referring to the second COVID wave in India as well. In a democracy, citizens are supposed to be falconers. So falconer is somebody who calls the falcon. So uh, in a democracy, citizens, citizens are supposed to be falconers and elected representatives, they're falcons. Those who are elected should be responsible to the calls and cries of their electorate. Successive governments in most parts of the country have however demonstrated that as far as health is concerned, the falcon cannot hear the falconer. India's health sector and statistics have been ringing alarm bells for long. So, you know, one of the arguments that has been made is that the second COVID wave just came all of a sudden. We didn't have the chance to be prepared. We could not prepare ourselves. Nothing could have been done. But I, I'll tell you why the alarm bells were ringing for a very, very long time, actually. So, India, one example is that India has been the world's largest contributor to under five child deaths since 1953. Since 1990, since we have the first internationally comparable estimates, uh, India has been the world's largest contributor to deaths uh, at all levels, uh, at pre especially premature mortality, whether we consider premature as population below five years of age, 20 years of age, or 70 years of age, which is taken internationally. So India has been the world's largest contributor to all levels of premature mortality. It has also been the world's largest contributor to death due to communicable disease in general and respiratory infections and tuberculosis in particular. So COVID-19 is a respiratory disease and the alarm bells have been ringing since 1990 at least. In the more recent past, in 2017, for example, more than 60 children died in a Gorakhpur hospital due to lack of oxygen. We saw people running around day in and day out to somehow get oxygen cylinders and refills during India's second COVID wave. The results of ignoring the alarm bells and early warning signals. So this is a term which is used in health surveillance, early warning signal, EWS. So I'm, I'm arguing that these early warning signals were there for a very long time. It became clear, things fall apart, the center cannot hold. Lack of oxygen acquired pandemic proportions during India's second COVID wave. Who says the second wave was the failure of the health systems, the lack of oxygen, the shortage of medicine and vaccines, etc., what unexpected. And there is little we could have been that could have been done to be prepared for this. So ma'am referred to the national health policy of 2017. Even the national health policy, you know, accepts that one of the most important, so I'm quoting from the national health policy 2017, one of the most important strengths and at the same time challenges of governance in health is the distribution of responsibility and accountability between the center and the states. So, as I said, you know, I, I feel that uh, the, the issue of responsibility is one of the main factors why we have such, you know, uh, really bad health outcomes uh, in the country. So there has been a fundamental lack of clarity and consensus in India regarding the nature of the state's responsibility for health. Uh, while health is the constitutional responsibility of state, the center has, in practice, played a leading role at various levels, with several central departments not willing to give up their powers. 
this has led to a situation in which both the center theoretically and the states practically are able to disown responsibility for the health of citizens. And since, you know, uh, the rise of what is referred to as lifestyle diseases, like chronic diseases, you know, diabetes, hypertension, and, you know, cardiovascular diseases, they are referred to as lifestyle diseases. And ever since the rise of lifestyle, the so-called lifestyle diseases and the free market system in India, uh, so then there has been an argument that, you know, uh, the WHO has listed out four, uh, you know, activity, four things to do in order to address the risks of, uh, you know, lifestyle diseases. You know, you need to uh, eat properly, you need to walk, you should avoid tobacco and alcohol. Now, all these things are there which individuals can do at their own level. So somehow uh, the impression goes out that, you know, you yourself are responsible for your health. It's your health, it's your responsibility. You need to walk, you need to eat better. You need, you need to stop smoking, you need to stop uh, drinking alcohol. So somehow the arguments of, so with the rise of the lifestyle diseases in particular and the free market system, there has been a more aggressive shifting of responsibility for health towards the citizens, individuals themselves. Now, uh, as far as the shortage of oxygen is concerned during the second COVID wave, I am going to read out certain statements of union health ministers, which also shows why the lack of oxygen was also a result of the confusion about responsibility for health. So uh, the first statement is by Mr. Piyush Goel, who said, state governments should keep demand for medical oxygen under control. The demand side management is as important as the supply side management. Containing COVID-19 spread is the responsibility of state governments and they should fulfill this responsibility. The second quotation is a response which the Minister of State for Health and Family Welfare gave in response to a question in the Raj Sabha. He said, health is a state subject. Detailed guidelines for reporting of deaths have been issued by the Union Ministry of Health uh, to all states and UTs. Accordingly, all states UTs report causes, of, causes and deaths to Union Health Ministry on a regular basis. However, now this is important and you must have read, uh, heard about the controversy that nobody died due to lack of oxygen. So, they, then he says, no deaths due to lack of oxygen has been specifically reported by state UT. Now he says that the data collection about deaths and cases is collected at the state level. So, and then, uh, you know, uh, states are supposed to, uh, it, they, it's a very fairly decentralized system, you know, the data. So there is, there are, there are two kinds of data that we have in the health sector. So we have two kinds of data in the health sector. So one is the administrative data, which is also referred to the MI as MIS. Uh, so every program, every health scheme has its own MIS, uh, which is used uh, to assess the progress on that scheme and you know do course correction. And uh, every year that data is reported. So that data starts uh, getting collected from the very primary health center level. Then it goes to the district level, then it goes to the state level, and the states report it to the center. Now, so the Union Health uh, Minister of State for Health and Family Welfare is saying that uh, we did not get any data from the states about deaths happening during the second COVID wave due to lack of oxygen. Now, if you see that there is WHO has uh, something called the FIC, Family of International Classifications. So as part of that, there is an international classification of uh, diseases ICD. Uh, so under that, you know, you have different causes of death being given. Now, if you see the burden of uh, deaths due to cardiovascular diseases is the highest. It's almost close to 27, 28% in India, for example. Now, one of the reasons what happens is that let, let's say somebody falls from a high uh, altitude and falls down. Now, what might happen is that that person might go into a trauma or shock and might die actually due to a heart attack. Because death is what? I mean, death is uh, primarily your heart stops functioning. So what happens is that many times, the ultimate, the final cause of death is, is there? Okay. So can I move it? Okay. So there is a page on the whose responsibility is uh, oxygen. Yeah, the previous one, previous one. I'm sorry. 
sorry, I'm taking more time. Yeah. So if you see here, he said that nobody died due to oxygen. And so what happens is that even the training to doctors, so now doctors are typically uh, give a sign of cause of death. Uh, and even the doctors, so there are two issues here. One is that the doctors are not properly trained to assign cause of death. That's one issue. The second thing is they are also taught not to give a cause of death, which can become a challenge, which can be challenged in the courts. Because if you give a cause of death and there is a litigation, there is a court case, so then the doctor who has assigned the cause of death will also be called by the courts. So then they try to give very generic uh, case, you know, causes of death, you know, this person died due to this. So oxygen is a supply side issue, you know, it's not like you don't, I mean, in terms of the classification, the technical classification, there is no space to assign oxygen as a cause of death. So there have to be mechanisms, but then, you know, uh, these sort of issues. So what you see, this is a typical case that even small challenges like, you know, many of us also were running around for getting oxygen for our family members and, you know, getting oxygen concentrator or getting refills. I know some people, some of you might have also experienced that. But then that particular challenge does not get captured in the data systems that we have. So if a challenge, which was so widespread, does not get, you know, uh, reflected in the health data, how are you even going to address it? So there is a huge problem. On the other side, we have the surveys. So I hope, uh, you know, different surveys happen and then they are able to capture these things. So there is something also called verbal autopsy. You know, if uh, the person did not die in a hospital setting or if no cause of death was assigned, uh, there is a very descriptive case history taken from the friends or relatives of that person. Uh, and then it is given to two doctors and then they assign a cause of death. So sometimes in, in those sort of situations, you can, uh, you know, uh, show that, okay, this person did not get oxygen and then he also did not get a hospital bed. Like I remember my wife had to be hospitalized and so we were getting a hospital bed, but without any guarantee for oxygen. So, I mean, after a lot of struggle, we could somehow, you know, find a, a very low class hospital, which had oxygen also. So, I mean, you know, people have gone through all these things and, and they know the experiences and, you know, uh, what they have faced and then you get statements uh, by a minister saying, saying nobody died due to lack of oxygen so i think this sort of thing needs to be very clear can you move on to the next slide now if you look at this slide the the, uh, the share of center and state uh, in terms of public the government's expenditure on health so this is uh, a, a division of uh, the government general government expenditure on health Can you go two slides back? One, one more, one more. Yeah. So if you see here that this is a breakup of the government uh, expenditure on health, and you see that the blue bar is that of the states and UTs combined, and the orange bar is that of the center. So if you look at this, I mean, uh, you can see a lot of things. You can commit a lot. You can say, I care for the poor. But if you see a poor and how much do you give out of your pocket is what actually matters. That, that's a clear indication of, you know, uh, you know, how you feel about something. So if you, if you take financing, health sector financing as a concrete indicator of the commitment to health. So even here, you see that the states have been spending almost two thirds of the total government health expenditure. Can we move to the next slide? Now here, this is a very interesting comparison. So if you compare what the governments combined, uh, the state and center are spending per capita, per person, uh, general person uh, on health, which is the blue bar, and what the central government is spending on its own employees under the CGHS, the central government health scheme, which is the orange bar, you see that 
what the government, central government is spending on its own employees is almost six times higher than what is being spent on the ordinary citizens. So for them, it, I mean, this is a clear indication that the health of their own employees is seen as much more, you know, important than the health of the ordinary citizen. I mean, it's not a matter of lack of resources. What I'm trying to say here is there are resources in the system. And I have done field work in Saharanpur district of Uttar Pradesh. I remember going to a primary health center. And this guy asks me, uh, why is the government sending so much money? So have they taken a loan from the World Bank? I mean, I'm just quoting him exactly what he said. He said, has the government taken a loan from the World Bank? Why are they sending so much money to a primary health center? We don't know how to use it. So there is money in the system. But then sometimes, you know, the people don't know how to use it, actually. Can I move to the next slide? Now, but then what we see eventually is that the blue, uh, the, the blue pie is what the people are spending out of their own pocket. So out of the total health expenditure in the country, almost two thirds is paid by people out of the pocket. Now, given the state of uh, poverty in this country, SDG 3.8 specifically refers to universal health coverage. Uh, so there are two parts of SDG 3.8, 3.8.1, which is about access to basic health services and uh, 3.8.2 is about uh, out of pocket expenditure on health. Now, if we see that India is way far behind uh, the SDG 3.8.2 and also to the realization uh, by 2030. Now, this also relates to SDG 1, which is about poverty. So uh, in some ways, as we also uh, argue subsequently that uh, we also need to take an interrelated, uh, you know, integrated approach to the SDGs. I'm sure the, these discussions might have come uh, uh, in the past uh, two days also, uh, that uh, SDGs are integrated. And if there is poverty, if there is, uh, you know, a lack of performance in terms of SDG 1, you also see it reflected in terms of SDG uh, 3, for example. So uh, we see that it's the people, despite all their financial situations and, you know, Recently, due to COVID-19, many people have been laid off, they have lost their jobs, unemployment is at its height. And all, despite all that crisis, we see that people are spending out of pocket. Now, if you see that, uh, I mean, you may provide them uh, public health uh, care, but then there is an aspiration even in the villages. So as part of my field research, I have also seen very poor people, I mean, whom you will not expect that they can afford on quality education and health, but they want to send their children to the best schools as much as they can afford. They want to go to the best uh, health systems, private. Now, many people also argue, you may ask, you know, you are very poor. How can you afford, uh, uh, you know, private health, uh, private health care? But there are also other dynamics at play. So in one village, I remember, I went and uh, talked to different people about access to health care. Same village. One primary health center. Now you get very different responses from uh, different people by their background characteristics. Now Dalits and Muslims will tell you that the people in the primary health center, they don't treat them well. They humiliate them. Now to avoid that humiliation, it's not always poor quality health care. It's also about you are, how you are treated as a human being. So then they say, if I go to the private sector, I am at least treated respectfully. Because I'm paying 200 rupees, I'm treated respectfully. While if you go to people of the upper caste, for example, and ask them about the same primary health center, they will say, excellent. The doctor is so good, he even give, delivers medicines to our uh, house. I don't have to go there, he comes to our house, actually. So, you know, there is no singular uh, evaluation. So as part of the National Health Mission, uh, there are different teams sent to, uh, sent to different districts to evaluate its performance. Uh, under the uh, program implementation plans. Uh, and you see that they come out the, with their reports. But what I argue is that there is no single assessment of the same thing because different people experience it in different ways. And you also have to see how that same facility is responding to different groups uh, within a society. Now, if you, can you see? now, because of all this confusion, as I'm also referred to, India is very much behind its uh, peers within the top 10 economies in the world. So uh, the late uh, Mr. Arun Jaitley used to say, 
we are the top among the top five economies in the world. We now aim to become among the top three economies. So there is a very strong aspiration in terms of the economic sphere that you know we want to be the top among the top three economies. But we have to see what the uh, Indian government has been spending on health. So the total health expenditure, if you compare India with others in the top ten economies, so presently India is among the top five economies, and you see it's spending two seventy five dollars. The total health expenditure is two seventy five dollars, which also includes what people are paying out of their pockets. Now the domestic general government health expenditure, as percentage of this total health expenditure, is only twenty seven percent. Now, how do you expect to be among the top three economies or top economies in a time when human capital investments are very critical? You know, the, if you look at the composition of the economy, uh, the the largest share comes from the service sector, and the service sector is very human capital intensive. If you don't invest in the education, skilling, and health of your citizens, you can never afford. You know, expect to go to the top. So then, out of pocket is also among the highest. Is not among the highest; it's the highest actually uh, among the top ten economies, which is sixty-three percent. And what do you expect in a poor country that uh, the life expectancy at birth is only sixty-nine years? If you go look at the healthy life expectancy, which is way much more lower than this. Next slide. Now, this is the the context that I have put in front of you. Now, I quickly want to make two sets of arguments here on why the government should. Accept the responsibility for health. So first is the epidemiological argument. So uh, can we go to the next slide? Yeah. So this and the next few also uh, slides also show that health is not just about healthcare. Health is determined by you know a variety of uh, structural intermediate factors, and this is how health is also related to the other SDGs. If you see many of these, uh, the SDGs are also reflected here. So health is not just about healthcare. If you simply give me medicines, that's not enough. As a government, I expect more from you, because health. So this is where the the issue of relative responsibility comes into the picture. Now, if I ask you, please, can you? Uh, get, let's say if I ask you, can you give me a paracetamol? You say, yeah, I can. Give, I can give you. I have a first aid box, and there is a paracetamol. I can give it to you. Now I ask you, can you give me an oxygen cylinder in the next five minutes? You say I cannot. There is a system for oxygen cylinder, and it's not easy to get an oxygen cylinder. If I ask you some of something higher, you say I cannot arrange it, because you know uh, we have our own relative strengths and weaknesses. So the government, uh, governments in general, are you know much more better placed in acting upon the international, national, and local determinants of health. Which this uh, graph reveals. So this graph is taken from the WHO's report on the Commission on Social Determinants of Health, which was released in 2008. So if we see that you know, socio-economic and political context, governance at large, not just health governance, but governance at large, policy, cultural and societal norms and values, they interact with education, occupation, income, gender, all these things, and then that leads to uh, aggregate. As well as the distribution of health and well-being in a particular society, so governments have a comparative advantage on acting on these issues, and which I will come to later is uh, is the, the preventive uh, responsibility that governments have. Next slide, please. If we look more specifically to uh, the tuberculosis, you know, which India has been the biggest contributor to at the international level. We see that it's linked to SDG one, and this graph, you know, shows. So I'm not going to get into how this actually happens, but if you see this graph, uh, that SDG one, uh, social protection and poverty, uh, render you vulnerable to the risk factors of tuberculosis, and then you know that is where we are. Next slide. Now mental disorders again. Uh, so in, in health, we normally look at death, disability, and disease. Uh, so, if you look at the the disability part, uh, the highest burden of disability is comes from musculoskeletal disorders. You know, neck pain, lower back ache, you know, all those things. This, they have a huge impact on uh, you know disability and mental disorders. You know, anxiety, stress, and this COVID nineteen has actually raised this uh, in two ways. One is that COVID itself, you know, biologically speaking. Uh, leads to certain neurological problems, and you may suffer from anxiety, stress, and all those things. 
the other is through the socio economic route you know you lose your job or you know you are your job is at risk then you know as a result of that you are also at risk of mental disorders so even mental so if we see that mental disorders are also linked to the larger uh, you know sphere of sdgs and this is how you know they are impacted so when we talk about health what i am trying to emphasize here is that giving medicines or health insurance is not enough there are much larger issues at play that we need to take care of next slide please yeah sure okay so again this is about covid 19 also so with respect to covid 19 we are told you know wash your hands wear a mask and you know do all that that's very important of course uh, so somehow uh, you know the responsibility is shifted onto the individuals which i'm not denying that's very important we need to practice the social uh, you know personal hygiene and social distancing and all of that but even who gets infected and who goes through what sort of impact of COVID-19 is also determined by broader issues. It's not just about what you, uh, you know, the risk that you face at the individual level. Next slide, please. Now, this is where I come that I uh, propose two kinds of responsibilities as part of the epidemiological argument. So preventive is what uh, the government can do at its own level, at the structural level. So monitoring and tackling health risks at international national and local levels to prevent disease protect and promote health at the population level this usually involves high level coordination and action and investment and focus on research and surveillance a curative responsibility is what we see happening in this country that you know i give you ayushman bharat i give you medicines and this and that that's that happens when you fail in your preventive responsibility why do i get sick if you are very strong in terms of your preventive aspect people less people will fall sick and there will be less burden on healthcare systems so in fact uh, the the pressure that we saw on healthcare systems was very unfair i mean these guys were actually compensating for you know lack of focus on the preventive side and even in normal circumstances we know that healthcare system has suffered you know has a lot of shortages you know of manpower medicines this and that and in a pandemic like covid-19 even you know well established health systems of europe america they all collapsed so now what happened is that because of the failure at the preventive level you rendered the curative the healthcare systems vulnerable to all these challenges uh, can i go to the, the next slide yeah the next one now here i i want to this is my final slide so i quote from uh, aristotle in his book politics he says it is evident that the best politia which is you know a, a social arrangement is that arrangement according to which anyone whatsoever might do best and live a flourishing life it is the job of the excellent lawgiver to consider how they will partake in the flourishing life living that is possible for them now if you see that he clearly argues that you know it is the responsibility of so i mean if i ask you in general uh, forget about the health sector in general what is the responsibility of government what should we expect from the government i mean i saw i see a lot of uh, videos on youtube there, there is the election going to happen in Uttar Pradesh and people are asked, are you happy with the performance of the government? Uh, what, 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 what do you think about the elections, this and that? And I don't see the, the issue of social welfare coming up. People are actually not too much, not many people are concerned about development and you know, flourishing. I mean, so what exactly is the role of the government? So Aristotle argues that the state should be able to provide an environment for you to flourish. You know, and flourishing here means whatever capacities we all have differently as individuals and human beings so for example you know uh, some people might be good at something for some particular things so others might be good at something else so we need uh, we should have the capacity the state should provide the environment for us to identify and realize our respective potentials so that is what is expected from the state so in conclusion i would like to say that the state is well placed in terms of acting upon the certain determinants of health, especially at the larger level, and it should take a complete responsibility at that level. And this also includes uh, the wealthy sections of the society, because even as we have seen with COVID-19, even those who were rich were affected. I mean, it, does, it didn't matter whether you were rich or poor, everybody was exposed to COVID-19. So at the structural level, if you act strongly, if you take up the responsibility for health, you will expose your citizens and healthcare systems to uh, damage and risk. And if you are not able to do that, then you have you are liable to take complete responsibility of the curative cause. So Tamil Nadu, you know, in Tamil Nadu, 
they paid everybody's expenses for COVID-19. Whoever was hospitalized, their expenses were paid by the state government because they owned up their responsibility that they failed at this level. And because you failed at this level, you were supposed to compensate for that. So with those words, thank you very much. I'm sorry for the delay. Thank you very much, Dr. Ali. Um, of course, as you said, health is a multi-dimensional subject and there are many connotations, mainly the socio-economic connotations and the humanitarian approach, which you talked about is very important. We as a social sector organizations, uh, we work to the grassroots deep into the remote villages. And we really understand what you were talking about the PSCs and their impressions about the healthcare system is really different from what is there in the urban. So uh, we have to tackle the grassroots level questions of the healthcare